Friday night at Cary. I'm Bill Schlesinger. It's good to see you all back in the, in the new year. Uh, today we uh, kick off the first of our Friday night at Cary uh, speakers for the new year, Peter Del Tudici, uh, who heralds from the Arnold Arboretum at Harvard University and the Harvard Graduate School. Uh, but he tells me he was a native of California, uh, and uh, like many good environmental folk, uh, got his degree at UC Berkeley, uh, then a few years later came east uh, and got his PhD, undergraduate degree at Berkeley, got his PhD at Boston University working with Richard Cremack, Ginkgo's uh, is what I remember uh, saying, uh, and uh, has subsequently uh, distinguished himself looking at invasive species, uh, urban ecology, uh, urban plants, uh, his new book, uh, The uh, Wild Urban Plants, I think is the uh, title of it, by Cornell University Press, uh, will be available after uh, the lecture, courtesy, courtesy of the Merritt Bookstore, uh, out at a, a table there, and Peter will be glad to sign that. Uh, but tonight he wants to talk about a topic that I know he's been working on recently, which is the forest of the future, uh, what to expect. Uh, what to prepare ourselves for in the face of climate change and basis pests and pathogens. Peter, great to have you here. Now, is the microphone working? You all hear me? Oh, well, it is a real honor to be here. Yeah. No. I carry uh, Institute is world famous. And uh, the fact that I'm here addressing you tonight is, uh, it means an awful lot to me. And uh, I hope I live up to your expectations. One thing that I was telling Bill about is that my approach uh, to the environment, unlike a lot of the work that happens here at the Cary, which is uh, looking really at the global scale, is really to look at what's actually happening on the ground in front of us at this point in time. And asking the question, what does this mean? How did this happen? And what does this tell us about the future? So uh, as Bill mentioned, my book, Wild Urban Plants, is really focused on urban ecology and the vegetation that is uh, grows spontaneously in the urban environment. And what I'm going to do with this talk is branch out a little bit from the urban environment into the larger uh, world, encompassing both suburban and rural environments. It's interesting because, uh, you know, I take a sort of a, you know, when it comes to the question of invasive species, I'm not somebody who just uh, believes that, you know, uh, they're going to destroy the world and that they represent uh, unmitigated evil. Uh, I actually believe that they're much more symptomatic of environmental degradation than the cause of environmental degradation. But most environmentalists, as long as I limit myself to the city, they're happy. They'll, they'll more or less agree with me, and that's fine. But when I start to branch out into the countryside, uh, I get a lot of uh, pushback from them. They're not so willing to accept my idea. So without a little introduction, let me just jump right in. Now, this picture, I don't know how many of you recognize this plant. I know the people sitting in the front row recognize it right after that. Does anybody tell me what that tree is? That's the Atlantis. I took this picture in Cornwall, Connecticut, not too far from here. And it was in the middle of the woods. I was really shocked uh, to see it there because it's not a tree. You know, Cornwall is mostly state forest. And uh, there's a little bit of logging, but you certainly don't see Atlantis there every day of the week, and uh, it really, you know, represents this, you know, this thing that is happening all around us. So uh, that's really the topic of tonight's talk. Now, uh, deeply disturbed, uh, you know, the, the disturbance history of New England goes back uh, in its most recent, uh, you know, chapter to uh, when it was all covered with glaciers, anywhere between, depending on where you are in New England. Uh, 15 to 20,000 years ago, and in places the glaciers were as thick as uh, a mile high. Uh, and if you 
you know, pay attention to the geology, you can see uh, the impact of the glacier uh, fairly readily. This is glacial scouring. This is on the top of Cream Hill in Cornwall, uh, not too far from where uh, my family's house is. And so uh, even though this was maybe 15,000 years ago, uh, the evidence of this deep disturbance are all around us. Uh, the vegetation also reflects uh, this type of disturbance. These are um, some famous maps on tree distribution. This is the Canadian hemlock over here, and that's an elm species. But these contour lines represent how many thousands of years ago. This is based on pollen deposits in uh, wetlands or uh, lakes. And you can see how uh, Suga canadensis, starting at 12,000 years ago from its ref refuge here in Virginia, essentially bounced back and recolonized New England uh, beginning about you know, 10 to uh, you know, uh, 10,000 years ago. Uh, the elm tree had its uh, basis of its refuge was over here, and essentially, as the glaciers receded, it slowly moved back so into its old uh, haunt. So the vegetation tracks uh, these types of changes very uh, closely. And if you look at these modern range maps, if you go to uh, these were produced by the U.S. Department of Agriculture, the Forest Service. Albert Little spent a major part of his life drawing these maps for every species of tree in uh, the United States. And you can see here's the map of the paper birch, a la 1977. And we look at these maps, and we tend to think of them as this is the range of the species as God created it. This is where the species is supposed to be. And if it's out inside of this range, something is wrong. And you can see here that this is Betula nigra, the river birch, uh, which has a, a much more southern distribution. This is a bottom line species. This is clearly an upland species. But you can also see from these maps in 1977 that the paper birch is one of those species that with climate change will probably be leaving our area. Well, the river birch, excuse me, um, let me go back, the river birch is one of those species that, with climate change, will be uh, moving up. And it's already spreading uh, into the Charles River Basin in the Boston area, the Mystic River, and uh, the watershed of the Hudson River now has river birch in it. Some of it is from uh, planted trees that have spread, but also uh, from native populations. So clearly, these tree species are very dynamic. Um, the other thing about disturbance that you know nobody needs to be reminded about, uh, particularly in the wake of Hurricane Sandy, but uh, we have these periodic catastrophic events that really alter the environment in dramatic ways. And this, I, I call this. How many of you remember that uh, storm of last year, on October thirtieth, right before Halloween, the day before? And how many inches of snow did you get in this area? 24 inch. I mean, it was unreal. And it followed on a very warm growing season. So the trees all still had all their leaves, uh, which was somewhat anomalous uh, for the time. And so the amount of damage done by the storm was off the charts. Uh, and then the snow had a consistency of cement when it came out of the sky. And it didn't just break trees that were defective or had hollow centers, it broke healthy trees. So the impact of these kinds of events uh, you know, live on for many, many years. And you'll be able to track this storm in the forest uh, easily for the next 30 or 40 years. Uh, disturbance in all of its uh, forms there is very obvious in the New England landscape, not the least of which is the stone walls that uh, are everywhere. Uh, there's a, a feeling that somehow the early settlers, when they arrived here, built these stone walls as part of the land clearing process. But the fact of the matter is that the early settlers cleared the forest, cut down the trees, plowed the land, removed the stumps, and essentially practiced agriculture for a good 100 years. And most of the stone walls uh, were essentially built after the revolution, a period of time uh, from about the 1780s through the 1820s, when most of the stone walls were being built. And those rocks emerged to the surface as a result of deforestation and soil erosion associated with 100 years of agriculture. So the stone walls are really a reflection of a much earlier level of disturbance associated with the early settlement.
of New England. And if you want to you know, get a sense of what uh, New England looked like in its agricultural heyday, uh, you really, you know, there, the, this kind of farming has pretty much disappeared uh, from rocky New England. Maybe you find it in New York State, but uh, you know, you have to go to a third world country pretty much to see agriculture as it once was practiced in New England. This is in the Altiplano in uh, Ecuador. Uh, and you can see those little hedgerows and trying to eke a living uh, out of these very inhospitable climate with very, very thin soils. Or you see it here in uh, Northeast Asia. This is on a mountain known as Chiang Mai Shan, right on the border between China and North Korea. And vast stretches of land are being cleared, uh, essentially for the cultivation of ginseng, which you know people who take ginseng think that they are living in harmony with nature, without ever really thinking about where ginseng actually comes from. And it's cultivated on a massive scale. And you have to actually clear the forest to do it and remove the stumps. So it's not like if they were just doing logging, the forest would grow back. But once you totally destroy the soil structure, uh, that alters the ecology for uh, several hundred years at least. So these kinds of disturbances are still going on, even though we may not be aware of them in our New England area. But again, focusing on the Northeast, I think it's very important uh, to remember our history. And this graph from an article in Science Magazine shows the concentration of water-powered mills in the United States between uh, eight, uh, by 1840. Uh, it's really extraordinary. The red indicates the highest density of water-powered mills. Uh, so the extent to which our landscape was put in service of industrial production is extraordinary. And these are three counties in uh, southeastern Pennsylvania. You can see there York County, Lancaster County, and Chester County. And look at the number of dams on every single stream. They were eating out every available jewel of power they could out of it. And this is in the 1840s. So, you know, what we see today, that this has pretty much disappeared from our consciousness. We have no memory of just how extensively uh, the land that's now forested land had been uh, manipulated uh, for agricultural and industrial production. And of course, one of the major changes that has happened is uh, the replacement of the horse by the automobile, uh, which took place in the uh, you know, late 1800s, early 1900s. Uh, you know, this is a picture of uh, harvesting winter rye in Central Park. I'm sure this is the sheep meadow. You know, can you imagine doing that today? The reason you're doing it is those horses had to eat something. You know, and hay is a very low value crop. The further you have to haul it, the less money you make. So if you can produce it locally, uh, you know, you can make more money off of it. And, you know, the number of, you know, the amount of land devoted to hay production during the horse and buggy era is off the charts when you look at these old agricultural maps. And we've just, again, completely forgotten that. And, you know, this is, of course, my favorite slide, that in 1894, this is actually the first city planning conference held in the United States. The big problem uh, they predicted was that by 1950, many cities would be buried under nine feet of horse. Uh, I guess this was the global warming issue of the day, uh, and nobody could foresee uh, the invention of the automobile, which of course solved one problem, but created a uh, vastly more complicated, newer problem. Um, and, you know, and, and many of you know this, that the actual, the, the comeback of the forest in the Northeast following this incredible history of uh, disturbance and exploitation is one of the great success stories of uh, the environment. That our environment is much more resilient than people ever imagined. Uh, but what, what's very interesting about these forests that have come back is that, they, yes, they're forests, but they're very different from the forests that once occurred here. So uh, this is, you know, these charts have been produced by my colleagues uh, at the Harvard Forest in Petersand, Massachusetts. So these are the colonial distributions of various plants. And this is the modern distribution around 1999. And they, they uh, calculate this colonial distribution by 
If you go to the town hall and you actually look at the original uh, property uh, deeds associated with the original settlement of the town, they always say what species of tree is growing in the four corners of, of the property. And if you actually tally up all those trees, what species they are, you do that for every piece of property in every town, in every county, in every state of New England, you actually then get a picture of what the original uh, forest distribution was like. And so you can see here that uh, this is beech. Uh, beech is, which was once very common, pretty much uh, a, a minor part of our modern forest. Birch is increasing. This is mainly black birch. Hemlock, this is out of date because the hemlock woolly adelchid has now made a huge dent on our hemlock forest. Maple, gigantic increase in maple, mainly red maple. Um, let's see what that's over there. That's oak. Oak is uh, going into decline. Nobody actually is aware of what is happening to oak or why it's not reproducing. Hickory is more or less the same. Chestnut, completely gone. And then again, this is a little bit out of date. Pine, you can see that there's a big increase in pine here. Uh, it's pitch pine on the Cape, and then this is Pinostrobus. And it's my opinion that Pinostrobus is actually one of the big winners uh, with climate change. It seems to be increasing uh, dramatically uh, throughout our area. And the animals similarly reflect uh, the changes in uh, land use history. You can see the green line represents uh, the distribution of forest cover, which reached its nadir here around 1840, and has been coming back. And you know, animals uh, like open areas, they're the ones that are actually in decline, and these are our most sort of threatened species, those that need open land, because that's what's uh, in very short supply. And other animals like uh, this here, uh, this is the beaver. It was uh, driven into extinction in Massachusetts in 1700, reintroduced in the 1920s, and has taken off. The wolf uh, seems to be gone. Uh, Where's the deer here? There's the deer. Look at that line. I love this because Henry David Thoreau, who spent his entire life in Concord, Massachusetts, he once talked to somebody who once saw a deer in Concord. <laughs> <laughs> you know, I'm sure it's the same here. There is more deer uh, in North America, Eastern North America now than there have been since the glaciers receded. Uh, I mean, it's just unbelievable what has happened. So the animals have come back, but their relationship to the environment and to the human population is radically different from what it once was. I don't have to uh, say anything about this picture. Um, or this picture. This is a deer exposure. Uh, we built this in Redding, Connecticut, and I'm standing at the edge of the exposure, and this is the essentially the forest understory looking out uh, where the deer are free to roam, and then this next slide is turning around and taking a picture right inside the exposure. So the deer, by making their uh, choices about what to eat and what not to eat, are actually having a profound impact on the reproduction of tree and shrub species and are major determinants in what the forests of the future are going to look like. So they are a real major ecological force. There's no doubt about that. Uh, beaver, I mentioned them earlier, but you can see here, introduced in the 1920s, uh, and then in the 1940s, scattered distribution, mainly in the Berkshires, made it to Springfield by the 1970s, and in 1998, when this was drawn, uh, they had started moving into eastern Massachusetts, and I can tell you that just last week uh, in, um, let's see, what's it, Suffolk County, which is Boston, the county of Boston, there are now beaver <coughs> in Suffolk County, Massachusetts, so they have broken in through the 98 beltway and uh, are following the river courses. And there's this one area sort of on a landfill park, which is on the edge of a river, and the beavers, uh, they count 120 trees that had been cut down last year by the beavers. And that was their first year that they had been uh, reported in the area. So, uh, you know, the world as we know it is, you know, these are native species, but they're not necessarily, you know, recreating the native environment. So this idea that somehow all you need is native species and everything will be back the way it was is, is clearly oversimplistic. And, you know, it's much more complicated than that. And I like to talk about, you know, the environmental sort of awareness about non-native species really started with the gypsy moss, um, introduced accidentally in... Medford, Massachusetts, and this is a picture, 
Can you imagine doing this? Look at the ladders, climbing up the tree, hand removing the eight cases from the branches, trying to protect these giant elms from the gypsy moth. Uh, but this is the really important picture. You can see here, the black is Medford, Massachusetts. This is where the gypsy moth was originally introduced, and it was in around the 1890s that people really became aware of uh, how destructive this was. Then the blue area represented the area that was badly infested, and there really wasn't much they could do about it. But the red area was the area that, where they said, we are not going to let this pest escape from this area. This is really the first example where uh, a government agency, in this case the state of Massachusetts, said we are going to do something about this environmental problem, this invasive pest from Europe. We're going to contain it. And it was all out warfare. Uh, the high pressure spray hose was invented in Massachusetts specifically to uh, fight the gypsy moth. There was nothing remotely resembling this. And then, of course, uh, the other thing that was also invented in Massachusetts was uh, lead arsenic. Mm -hmm. And most of eastern Massachusetts is, was drenched in lead arsenic in a desperate attempt to control the gypsy moth. And you can go to the soils of virtually any suburb in eastern Massachusetts, and it's got beautiful forest going on it. And if you take a soil sample from that, you're going to find lead arsenic as a legacy of this action. And it's very interesting to remember that that was, you know, this is when economic entomology was just starting out. And their whole point was, we're going to prove to the world that we really, you know, have something to contribute to society, and we're going to show you how to control pests. Uh, those of you who aren't, don't remember uh, all the lead arsenate uh, probably will remember DDT. In the 1940s, at the end of World War II, through the 50s, and some, even into the early 60s, DDT became... Uh, the weapon of choice, the spray, aerial spraying throughout much of the Northeast, again, in a failed attempt to control the gypsy moth. So, you know, gypsy moth is here. The outbreaks aren't nearly as uh, disastrous as they once were. It seems to have somehow integrated itself into our ecology, and uh, you don't hear any more talk about aerial spraying or anything like that, but the legacy of these two compounds can still be detected in our soils. Other uh, major influences on our environment, of course, the chestnut uh, blight introduced from Asia. Um, this is one of the very last ancient chestnut snags. It's about a meter in diameter, a beautiful tree. But the, the, the chestnut actually still lives in the forest. There's little sprouts from the base. The, uh, the blight kills the individual stems, but those root suckers come up from an underground structure known as a lignotuber. So the plant still keeps smoldering at the roots. And what's really interesting about this, if you dig it up, there's a massive structure there. And these have been sprouting like this since the chestnut blight uh, came through in the 1920s and 30s. So what you see in the forest are these little seedlings that have been sprouting. They were seedlings at the time of the blight. Uh, have been sprouting like that for 80 years. So here's this massive tree that has essentially been reduced to the status of a shrub. Uh, on the landscape scale, the American elm is very iconic. Uh, in the 1930s, roughly 50% of the street trees in the Northeast uh, were the American elm. It was a very popular tree, not only is it beautiful, but it was uh, very common. You could dig it up from wetlands, you could prune the hell out of it, and then plant it, and it would grow one of those trees that was very easy to cultivate and it took to urban conditions extremely well, but uh, Dutch elm disease uh, from Europe made short order of that. And of course, this is a typical New England town, postcard a picture taken in the early 1900s, and you can see uh, what I mean when I say that 50% of the street trees were American elm. So when the disease struck, it just went right down the street and killed every single one of those trees. So. Again, you know, uh, the way we conceived of the planting our cities really set the table for this to become a very, very serious pest. And more recently, um, the Asian longhorn beetle has uh, been discovered in two locations in Massachusetts, one in Worcester and one in Boston. The Boston infestation was controlled, but the one in Worcester was allowed to uh, multiply unchecked for many years, and the net result is the removal of 30,000 trees 
uh, in an effort to keep this pest from spreading. And the one that is really most serious is uh, the animal of ash borer, which I'm sure is not too far from the carrier arboretum. Uh, this is a map. I think this is from 2011. I know that it has crossed the Hudson River, so uh, it's definitely here. And uh, you know, there seems to be no end to you know what is going to be the next pest that's coming. So these are all. It's almost as if there's a certain inevitability about it uh, that you know we just given globalization and you know, the complexities of the modern world, it's very, very difficult to actually uh, control these kind of things. This was, of course, introduced uh, originally in Detroit, and it uh, really has done most of its damage in the Midwest, and it's only recently uh, beginning to impact the Northeast. The hemlock woolly adelgid is one of the um, non-native insects that I've spent a long time uh, studying. Uh, here it is, uh, growing at the Arnold Arboretum. It's uh, you know all over this part of the, the world. Uh, hemlock trees, depending on their you know where they're growing, it may take uh, as long as ten years for the adults to actually kill the trees. If you go down into the southern Appalachians, the Great Smokies, where uh, the winters are a little bit milder, it may only take five years for the adults to actually kill these magnificent hemlocks. And this is an example of. Uh, shows the range of the hemlock in green and the uh, extent of the range uh, that has been impacted by the woolly adelgid. So we still don't know exactly how far north the adelgid is going to spread, but um, it's, had a ma it's had a major impact on uh, the distribution and the reproduction of uh, this particular species. But what I really want to show you is this particular slide. Now this is a climate data from the Arnold Arboretum. We built a weather station in 1962. So this is 50 years of data. You know, it's a little thermometer out in the middle of our nursery. So it's a very local condition. And you can see the, this is the minimum winter temperature. And the reason this is important is that when the temperature gets below uh, essentially minus, somewhere between minus 5 and minus 10, you get 98% mortality of the hemlock woolly adelgid. So that's what you really want. If you want a nice cold winter, definitely below minus five degrees. That will kill the majority of the adelgids. Now they'll come back, but it'll take them two or three years to build back to the same level they were at before. And you can see here that if you break this chart down from 1963 to 1984, the average minimum winter temperature was about five degrees Fahrenheit. But from 1985 through 2012, it's been essentially zero. That's almost a five degree difference. And you can see here that clearly the spread of the hemlock woolly adelgid is being driven by climate change. It's not just a question of this non-native species coming in here and devastating uh, our forest. It's actually the non-native species interacting with uh, climate change factors that is really bringing about that change. <laughs> and what's uh, you know, interesting from my perspective is once you take the hemlock out of the equation, what's the species that's going to replace hemlock? What's interesting is it's not another evergreen, it's actually black birch, Betula lenta, which is uh, increasing its distribution throughout the East Coast. And here's a, a major black birch forest. Most people have never seen this. And you can see the white pines coming in. Foresters, there's no models of forestry that predicted that black birch would replace hemlock if you took hemlock out of the picture. But it turns out that black birch is a disturbance adapted species. It doesn't matter whether it's logging, whether it's a hurricane or windstorm, or whether it's a hemlock woolly adelgid. Whenever you disturb the forest, there are certain species that are adapted to disturbance, and those are the ones that move in and really explode. So in our area, black birch is uh, the disturbance species par excellence when it comes to uh, trees. And, you know, this is just to summarize uh, some of the changes that, you know, uh, have affected our forests over the years. So again, our, we still have these forests, but they're radically different from, uh, you know, what they were a hundred years ago. Now, shifting gears a little bit, I want to talk about Urbanization, because urbanization is a factor, piece of this puzzle 
Uh, you know, people who don't live in the city think that you know, once they, they drive 30 miles, they get out of the city, they've left the city behind. But in fact, urbanization is, uh, you know, as a much, cities have a much bigger footprint than the actual city themselves. And so I'm going to talk a little bit about urbanization and how, what, what, ur what I mean when I talk about urban, uh, urbanization effects uh, in our forests and landscapes. So as Bill mentioned, um, uh, I wrote this book in 2010, Wild Urban Plants of the Northeast. It's a, it's a field guide. So even if you don't accept my sort of ideas about urban ecology, it, most of the book is really a field guide. So you can actually take this book and uh, use it to identify all the plants that grow spontaneously in the urban environment. So not the planted specimens, but the plants that reproduce on their own without any human intervention. Uh, the de facto vegetation of the uh, native vegetation of uh, the urban environment. This is a, a range map uh, from my book. Essentially, uh, we define urbanization, in this case, by densities of more than 500 people per square mile. You can see that you know, Montreal up in the north, Boston in the east, Washington, D.C. in the south, and Detroit in the west. That urbanization, we're not talking about sidewalk cracks here. We're talking about uh, major <coughs> environmental uh, factor. Urbanization is ubiquitous in the Northeast. It is a major driving ecological force. And understanding the impact of urbanization is really critical to understanding uh, what's going to be happening in the future. Uh, I love this picture. Uh, this is Los Angeles. There's the LA River. Uh, you know, and you can talk about, uh, you know, what is native to Los Angeles? I mean, you can, you can talk about what used to grow in Los Angeles, you know, before it was done. The concept that there's a native species in Los Angeles is, is an absurdity. There is nothing, plants are not, there's nothing that is native to this environment. This is an urban environment. The urban environment is a human creation built for human purposes. Any plant that grow there do so, uh, you know, on their, of their own volition. And so there is nothing, you know, the whole concept of a native species really doesn't work once you move into an urban environment. And, and on the flip side of that, the, the definition of an invasive species is a species that displaces a native species. So again, not only does the concept of a native species not work that well in an urban environment, the whole concept of an invasive species doesn't work either because there's not a lot of native plants to displace in the urban environment. So, uh, that's just a little aside. Um, now, this is, most of you are probably familiar with this, the, you know, one of the defining characters of the urban environment is known as the urban heat ion effect. This is a meta study from Europe, um, and it shows the squares are American cities, the circles are European cities, but as the population increases, uh, the temperature difference between an urban and a non-urban area, and that's in degrees centigrade, so 12 degrees centigrade is over 20 degrees Fahrenheit. This is on a warm summer night uh, when there's not a lot of wind, but that's a dramatic uh, difference between urban and rural areas. This is known as the uh, urban heat island effect. And the thing that I think is most important about this is that if you're interested in climate change and you want to know what's happening, what's going to be happening, all you have to do is go to the city. Because to a large extent, the cities have already heated up because of this heat island effect to the extent that's predicted for many uh, non-urbanized areas. So thinking about the cities, the cities are really have a lot to teach us about what is going to be happening in the world on a much uh, broader scale. Now, I mentioned that you know the typical definition of an urban area was based on population. But this is some work from uh, my colleagues at Boston University. Uh, bear with me here. Uh, this is Boston right here. And then this ring here is Route 95 that encircles Boston and goes down to Providence. But you can see here, zero, this is downtown Boston, 100 kilometers. That's the Harvard Forest in Peter Sam, Massachusetts. This is a transect that goes straight west for 100 kilometers. And then there are about 20 kilometers, there's Route 95. Okay, That's what you cross as you're going west from Boston. And you can see here that when you are inside the 95 belt, and these are square kilometer tracks all along that transect. So these are samples for the percentage 
of impervious surface. So one, inside 95 Beltway, virtually every single square kilometer that was sampled had 30% or more impervious surface. And once you get beyond uh, 90, 95, virtually all of the tracks had less than 30% uh, impervious surface. So why this is important is that this becomes a surrogate for defining urbanization. Urbanization essentially uh, can be defined as when you have 30% impervious surface or more, you have an urbanized condition. It really doesn't matter how many people live there. So that's from an ecological point of view. And that's very, very important because impervious surface is something you can calculate very easily from Google Maps. You know, that's a GIS technology essentially allows you to calculate impervious surface very, very easily. So this then becomes a sort of an ecological definition of a city. Now, uh, you know, other characteristics of the urban environment, um, I like to refer to this heavy equipment as the urban glacier, and I view urbanization as a form of, of glaciation. Essentially, uh, it you know, wipes out everything in its path, and what does it leave behind but compacted glacial till, all right? And what is the first plant that comes in following uh, this is ragweed. And what's really interesting, if you look at the pollen uh, that you find in, in lake deposits, immediately after glaciation, the most common pollen is always ragweed pollen. So ragweed has been a colonizing species from the get-go. And the fact that it's so ubiquitous in the urban environment, it's just essentially finding the same niche that it found uh, when the glaciers were receding from uh, New England. Uh, other urban factors that we don't think too much about is road salt. Uh, you know, we have a, you know this last little snowstorm, or we had one in Boston, it must have been uh, all of a half an inch. Yet the, the, the salting trucks were out there, they put down a full coat of salt, you know, the, the, the snow was gone, you know, by noontime, but all the salt was there. And it has a profound effect on our soil, mainly it increases soil compaction, decreases water availability in terms of the plants, and osmotic drought is called. It interferes with cation exchange, it makes it much more difficult for plants to actually get the nutrients they need, and most importantly, it elevates the soil pH, which means it favors a whole certain group of plants that are uh, come from uh, calcium-rich soils. Uh, and again, I mentioned Ilanthus at the very beginning, that's ubiquitous along our highways, and one of the reasons for its great success is we heavily salt our highways, and uh, Ilanthus um, is one of those species that comes from uh, limestone areas in China and likes a pH soil, high pH soil. So uh, what it finds on our roadsides is uh, very much to its liking. Acid precipitation uh, lowers pH. This is another uh, factor that uh, is typically very important in urban environments uh, and increases the nitrogen and sulfur content of the soil. One of the studies we did at Gianna Barbarino, we actually, because that's an environment that hasn't uh, it's been left as a natural area pretty much for the past 200 years. And when we measure the nitrogen content of the soils, and these are not soils that have been modified for horticultural purposes. These are just soils that are, you know, very rocky. Uh, hemlock, uh, we have this area called Hemlock Hill. There's, there's roughly 10 times more nitrogen in those soils than there are in corresponding uh, non-urbanized soils. So uh, as a result of uh, acid precipitation that's been happening in urban areas for a very long time, uh, you can have some profound soil impacts. But, uh, you know, not everything is as simple as it seems because acid rain uh, interacts with concrete and that leaches calcium in the environment, so it can also elevate the soil pH. So, in the urban environment, we can have uh, some soils have a very low pH as a result of uh, you know, a couple hundred years of acid precipitation, but in other areas you can have elevated uh, pHs because of the impact of acid rain in terms of its ability to degrade uh, limestone. And after many, many years of research done mostly, mostly in Europe, Europeans are way ahead of us in this, they have found that urbanization favors species that grow well in soils that are relatively fertile, have a 
moderately high nitrogen content, in other words, they're dry, they're unshaded, and the soils are relatively alkaline. So this is the profile of your typical urban plant. So the plants that grow in the urban environment fit, uh, do well in this type of environment. This is what cities are all about. And um, it's, a, it's very nice to be able to put it so succinctly. And once you begin to understand that those are drivers of uh, the urban environment, then it, you can begin to make sense out of the vegetational patterns that you see. Uh, of course, uh, if you know any ecology, you know that fragmentation is another uh, thing that is a, is a major factor in terms of understanding the distribution of vegetation. I like this picture because this is Los Angeles. You can see the, on the left-hand side that tunnel there. That's the old Arroyo Seco Parkway. It was a four-lane road. Uh, for two-way traffic, that, that was, you know, that, that was no longer suitable after about 20 years. And they had to build an extension on the right-hand side uh, and made each one one way. And you can see that when they built that tunnel, that did very little to the environment. But then when they built that freeway in there, it bisected it. So that's a graphic example of what fragmentation does. It creates edges. And those edges support uh, a very different type of vegetation than you find in the center of the parcel. And, you know, if, if you drive around any of the highways here, particularly if you drive down to New York, and then I like driving down on the Sawmill River Parkway, and you can, that's where I took this picture here. Uh, you know, this is the porcelain vine that grows. It just has wiped out everything in its way, and it's totally uh, a factor of an edge effect. And so, uh, you know, when people try to correlate uh, the distribution of invasive species, but one thing that always is found to be significant is the proximity to a road, because the roads create these edges, and the edges that are always disturbed, and that's where the invasive species uh, get established. So you can see here, uh, you know, sprawl uh, is a major uh, has a major impact, creates fragmentation, which creates edges, which promotes the growth of disturbance, adapted plants, and animals. So this only goes up to 1999. So sprawl is not something that, you know, just happened in the past. Sprawl is something that is, is very much uh, with us today. And that is one of the factors that is really uh, very important to understand when you're thinking about what's happening uh, to our environment. So just to sort of summarize a little bit, you can begin to, you know, one of the things about urban ecology is that, you know, you take your ecological theory and you try to put people into it. So it's the integration of people into ecological theory. So if you look at, you know, the past century here in the United States, uh, I've divided it somewhat arbitrarily into the following categories, you know, growth and mobility, 1900 to 1930, automobile replaces horse, expansion of rail lines, industrial pollution, forest exploitation, exotic plant introduction for ornamental purposes, energy from coal, and of course the big issues from an environmental point of view, sanitation and waste disposal. That's really what it was all about. The destruction of the old order, that would be the Great Depression, uh, World War II, um, you can see here agricultural abandonment, energy from oil starts to compete with coal, and the big issue of the day uh, associated with the Dust Bowl era is soil erosion. This is when a lot of the uh, species we now consider invasive were massively planted uh, at the encouragement of the U.S. Soil Conservation Service as well as state and local uh, conservation uh, agencies because saving the topsoil was considered the highest possible good and any plant that covered the soil surface was uh, terrific. So soil erosion was essentially the climate change issue of the day. Suburban fragmentation, um, following World War II up to, say, 1990, suburbanization, chemical agriculture, the spread of the automobile, expansion of the highways, plastics, and if you remember the first Earth Day, environmental pollution was what everyone was concerned about. And of course, today, uh, you know, it's globalization is what is really happening on a massive scale. The big issue is, of course, climate change and invasive species. So these are all moving targets that reflect, you know, larger issues that are happening on a global scale. And I, I really hate 
diagrams like this because I find them so confusing, but here I went and made one myself. But uh, this is sort of looking at the, the, the relationship between land transformation and forest development. And I use the term emergent. Uh, emergent ecosystems are produced by changing environmental conditions which result in the addition of new species and or the uh, unpredictable rearrangement of existing species. Okay, so what, what's really interesting is if you have native forests and you convert them to cities, uh, you know, or you convert them to suburbs, they can become cities. And if you abandon the cities, like uh, say Detroit, well, it's not going to revert back to a native forest. It's going to revert to a novel ecosystem. And uh, what's interesting is there are some forms of agriculture that are uh, less intensive than others. And you know, traditional agriculture, uh, you know, if you abandon that agriculture, it will revert back to native forests. The same is true of logging. But if you do it on an industrial scale, uh, and the disturbance is intense enough, you will create these novel ecosystems. So this is sort of soft uh, disturbance, if you will, and the red represents hard disturbance. And once the land has been transformed through hard development, that is to say paving, there is no going back. You cannot then, what you can revert to forest, but it's not going to be a native forest. This is really important. You know, in the past, the agriculture that, you know, in, the, that was in New England that was abandoned in the 1840s was a very soft form of agriculture. So the forest came back, mostly native species. You know, if we were to abandon New England at the same scale again, the forest would come back, but they would be a radically different forest. Uh, they would not just be native species only, I guarantee you of that. So let's look at some of the, what these emergent forests actually look like. Uh, I mentioned Detroit earlier. It's a, you know, it's, a, it's a very depressing place if you actually look at the socioeconomic conditions that prevail there. But if you're interested in urban vegetation the way I am, uh, it's a great place to visit. Uh, because Detroit has been actually in the process of being abandoned since the 1960s. So you get to see abandonment that's been playing out for 40, uh, in some cases as much as 50 years, and you're beginning to see real forests take shape in large portions of Detroit. Uh, so, you know, I call them, you know, I guess this is a, an effort to change, uh, you know, people's uh, opinions about this type of, I call it cosmopolitan urban vegetation. That's AKA weeds, basically. But you know, this is a you know, there's no such thing as a weed per se. A weed is just a plant you don't like. So you know, that's a value judgment. So given that we're in this business of value, you know, applying value to everything, I thought I might as well put my two cents worth in. But um, I want to show you a couple of the, the sort of the plants that make up this new cosmopolitan vegetation. Not the least of which is one of our native species. Robinia pseudoacacia, the black locust. This is considered to be the native range from Albert Little of the black locust. And what's interesting is if you look at this map of Castania dentata from Wilson, it shows that you know the chestnut. It didn't reach Massachusetts till about a thousand years ago. It's a very recent thing, and it actually looks a lot like the distribution of black locust. Black, you know, it, it's made its way to New England. Black locust is headed in the same direction, but it just didn't make it to New England. And this is one thing that really irks me, because I was on the Invasive Species Committee for the state of Massachusetts. We declared black locust non-native, an invasive species in Massachusetts. Even though people began planting it in Massachusetts in the mid-1700s, farmers planted it Post because it hadn't reached Massachusetts by the time the Pilgrims landed. Therefore, it's not a native species. Therefore, the possession was intent to distribute black locust is illegal in Massachusetts. And it's just, you know, I understand, okay, why it's on, you know, it's considered not native, but it, from an ecological point of view, it doesn't make a lot of sense. This is the actual distribution of black locust. Okay? <laughs> this is where you find black locust reproducing spontaneously. And you might well put all of Europe and most of Asia in here as well, because this is North America's gift to the world. This was uh, planted extensively and fixes nitrogen and it produces this rot resistant wood. 
So if you go to South Korea, just for example, the hillsides are covered with black oak. It was all planted by the Japanese prior to World War II. You go to Spain. Northern Spain is planted with eucalyptus and black oak. It's because these are forestry species. So the idea that somehow this native range is somehow sacrosanct and that we can somehow go back to this uh, seems to me to be uh, a very dubious uh, assumption. A lot of the plants I mentioned, Atlantis, you know, uh, the word I use is pre-adapted. So they come from environments in nature that resemble the urban environment. So they're pre-adapted. They're not adapted to the environment. They're pre-adapted. So here it is on the Great Wall of China, outside of Beijing, on these dry limestone hills. And there it is on the Great Wall uh, near the Arnold Arboretum. Uh, it's found the exact same habitat niche. Or, you know, what is a brick building but a limestone cliff? You know, this is uh, New London, Connecticut. This is Polonia tomentosa. Again, another Chinese species. And it is found the exact equivalent of where it comes from uh, in China. And, you know, most of our cities are built on rivers, and rivers are naturally disturbed environments because the water level is constantly fluctuating. Uh, land is being exposed, it's being covered by water. And so disturbance-adapted species uh, are the ones that always perform best on these river corridors. And perforce, uh, there's always a very high percentage of non-native species along our riverbanks because river corridors are naturally disturbed. And here you can see in uh, Washington, D.C., this is the Anacostia River. The entire understory is uh, this is honeysuckle, uh, which is again, a manifestation of the level of disturbance. Uh, you know, when uh, after the uh, American elms were all wiped out by Dutch elm disease, horticulturists went back to the drawing board and they had to figure out another species to plant to replace it. And what they did hit upon was, of course, the Norway maple. It wasn't as big as the elm. It was very salt tolerant. did extremely well in urban environments. But what they didn't count on was that it would spread and become, it was so well adapted that it spread on its own. And so, uh, as I mentioned, uh, in the case of black locust in Massachusetts now, we have this uh, amazing situation where the, you know, distribution, or uh, distribution, no, sale with intent to distribute Norway maple is a more serious offense than the uh, sale of intent to distribute marijuana. Now, I never thought I would live to see that day. So marijuana is now a parking ticket, uh, a fine in Massachusetts, whereas selling Norway maple is a uh, punishable offense. So again, in the eternal quest for you know more uh, better adapted street trees, of course uh, you can't plant the Norway maple anymore. What do you come up with the Bradford pear? And you know you don't have to look very far uh, or wait very long. In this case, about 30 years after it was uh, widely planted and introduced, uh, the calorie pear uh, is spread throughout the, um, again, this is the Anacostia watershed outside of uh, DC. So, uh, you know, this, <laughs> the search for, uh, you know, tough urban plants that are not invasive, that's a, that's a tough, uh, that's a tough bill of the fail. There's a lot of species that are constantly being taken off the list. Not a lot of species are being put on that list. So it's, a, it's actually a, a little bit of a, a crisis that's sort of building up. Uh, in the shrub area, uh, common buckthorn, that's Rhamnus uh, cathartica. Uh, here it is in November, mid-November. It still has its leaves. Uh, again, it's able to grow long after the native vegetation has lost its leaves, and that makes it more efficient. Uh, our Japanese barberry, uh, another uh, ubiquitous member of the, the shrub understory in our area. Um, and again, how did it get here? Just look at this from this advertisement from 1895. $20 per hundred, 24 to 30 inches tall, 1075 per dozen. So, you know, this is 1895. So, uh, and of course, you couldn't plant the common barberry because there was a wheat rust associated with that. So, this doesn't spread it. So, this essentially became uh, the ornamental of choice. And uh, bittersweet, this is a plant, and you, know, you may think that I love all plants, but 
Uh, this is one that I absolutely despise. Uh, if you have it in your yard, you know what I'm talking about. Uh, Solascus orbiculatus. Uh, again, widely planted during the 1940s, 50s, and 60s. Uh, you know, you read the horticultural books, a beautiful ornamental, great fruit. The birds love it. Yes, the birds do love it. They spread it everywhere. And it root suckers. It's impossible to get rid of. And the reason I, I sort of point this plant out as, as one I don't like is because it's a vine, and as such, its goal in life is to knock down trees. So if you want to have a forest, you want trees, you cannot have a lot of vines. Those two life forms are essentially incompatible. And these vines only get started on the edge, and then they just move in from the edge and knock the forest down in its wake. And so, uh, again, this is how the edge effect plays into uh, this whole issue. And of course, it's not just that it's a native, uh, a non-native species, but we have our native grapes. They actually uh, do the same thing. If they get established in a forest, uh, they can do great damage because they increase the amount of weight on the branches. And if you have a nice and snowstorm, you get a lot more breakage. Uh, and then the herbaceous plants, you all recognize this, uh, the Japanese knotweed. And this is from William Robinson the wild garden, if you know your horticulture. He was very influential in terms of Olmsted. Olmsted loved the wild garden. That was the effect that Olmsted was going for. And you can see uh, Robinson singing his praises. Uh, it's just uh, got a little bit out of control. And you know, in an urban area, it's OK, because it's not necessarily going to go anywhere. But this, this picture I took along the White River uh, in Vermont. and was that Hurricane Irene from two years ago that just wiped out uh, large portions of the, you know, the White River and other watersheds in Vermont. It knocked out a lot of trees and shrubs and scoured uh, the river valleys. But the Japanese knotweed, which has a very deep root system, was totally unaffected. And there's been an explosion of Japanese knotweed throughout Vermont in these highly disturbed river basin areas. So, uh, you know, this is, a, this is going to be a major issue that uh, the state of Vermont is going to have to deal with. So, in an urban area, this plant is just sort of an annoyance, but actually, once it gets established in a non-urban area, it can become a very serious problem. And, you know, you're all familiar with this in the herbaceous layer. I don't have to say anything about it, but I took this picture uh, in, in Cornwall, and what's interesting, it looks like a pure stand of garlic mustard, but there's actually a lot of impatience in there, impatience capensis. And the two of them seem to coexist. So it's not as though you only can have garlic mustard. And if you uh, don't know this plant, you should uh, watch out for it. This is a preview of coming attractions. This is uh, making its way up in the south. It's already uh, in southern Connecticut, and I'm sure it's probably in this area, Japanese stiltgrass. And it forms this incredible carpet uh, in the understory of a relatively uh, disturbed forest. So just to conclude, uh, with a couple of slides, the dynamics of these emergent ecosystems, the interacting forces of urbanization, climate change, and globalization. And this is critical. They're chronic stress factors that destabilize native ecosystems and favor the spread of opportunistic species. Water, air, soil pollution impacts soil chemistry, which impacts microbial activity, which impacts nutrient cycling and vegetation patterns. And finally, habitat fragmentation creates sunny edges, which are dominated by fast-growing, disturbance adapted species. Um, and in terms of my predictions, the composition of these emergent forests in the tree level or the tree layer, generalists are favored over specialists. Bottomland species that are essentially disturbance adapted uh, over upland species, and early successional over late successional species. The shrub layer is increasingly dominated by non-native edge-loving species that produce leaves in early spring and hold them in the late fall. Vines are becoming more abundant, creating vinescapes that move into the forest from disturbed edges, smothering trees in the process. And the herb layer is increasingly dominated by adaptable species that re can reproduce readily from seed and compete aggressively for available soil nutrients. So this is these are the this is what's happening. These are the dynamics that you know I see happening, uh, you know, in our forests. And my sort of take-home message I, I don't have to read that you can all see that is that you know it's it's a whole new ecology 
Now, the issue of whether you like it or not, I, I don't see that as you know, all that relevant. It's really understanding what's happening and then figuring out how do we manipulate it to uh, serve our purposes, both uh, environmentally as well as aesthetically. So thank you very much for your attention. I really appreciate it. Well, I think that, you know, I, I tried to hint at this Robinia, black locust, 
was, you know, extensively planted for, you know, uh, going back to the early 1800s, started in France, and, you know, where they're, they had, France had been totally deforested, and they looked to North America for species to reforest France. And, this, you know, in Europe, black locusts would essentially grow just about anywhere. So for a good hundred years, it was extensively planted. Now, of course, they consider it an invasive species, and planting it is forbidden. But uh, it's here to stay. I guess what I would say is that, you know, if a species has been here, as opposed to dividing the world up into native and non-native, let's just declare them naturalized and forget it. I think, you know, and let's focus on species that are not well established where we have a chance of actually uh, having an impact. But there are certain species that I think we might as well just, you know, declare victory and uh, you know, give them a green card. <laughs> give them a green card. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> no, I, I, you know, I honestly believe that. And and they do that in Europe. Actually, they divide the plants that are, you know, were introduced before 1500 as one type of plant, even though it may have come from southern Europe. They, they, those are called archaeophytes, and they treat them as though they're native species. And the plants are introduced after 1500 with the discovery of the New World. Those are called neophytes. And those are in a different category altogether. So the way I would do it in North America is if it was here before 1800, you just give them a pass. And uh, if they were here after 1800, well, then, you know, that's debatable how you want to treat them. But, you know, I just don't see any value in, you know, this, this dichotomy of native and non-native just in the world we live in, I don't think it makes a lot of sense. It's not a very useful way to categorize the world. Maybe one more. How about down here? Uh, hindsight is wonderful. And I'm just wondering, if, by looking back, can you identify the types of mistakes that were made in trying to manage nature? How do we make sure that we're not making those today? So 50 years from now, we don't get cussed out. <laughs> <laughs> no, I, I'll, be, I'll be glad to have you do that. <laughs> <laughs> I, I, I guess what I would say and that's a, is that I'm a, you know, I'm a very, uh, I have great humility because I am sure that we are doing things that the generation that is very young are going to say, what were they thinking? And my, the, my feeling is with climate change, you know, 50 years from now, they're going to look back at what where we are today, and that they're just going to shake their heads. So, you know, I think you know the stakes are much higher, and I think that's where we're really dropping the ball big time. And in terms of environmental management, what I would say, what's interesting, and I, I know some people in the audience are not going to like me hear me say this, but doing nothing is sometimes better than intervening. And especially when it comes to ecological systems, time is a great healer of all kinds of wounds. And in the case of the hemlock willy adelgid, we know that if you go in there and you preemptively log those hemlocks, because they're going to be killed by the adelgid to try and get that wood out of there, you do much more damage than if you let them die slowly over time. Because the forest has a chance to, it takes about 10 years to kill a hemlock, and the forest has a long time to recover. Whereas if you go in there and you log them and you remove them, that actually has a much more profound impact. So in some cases, uh, leaving nature to do nature, to do its own thing, is, is uh, sometimes uh, the best thing. Peter, many thanks. I think you've given everybody a lot of say that our next Friday night at Terry, now uh, be careful here, Friday night at Terry is going to be Thursday, February 7th, mm -hmm. because we have, by virtue of being flexible on our date selection, the opportunity to have John Jarvis, who heads the U.S. Uh, National Park Service, uh, speak to us. So we'll call it Friday night at Terry, but the next one is Thursday, February 7th, 7 o'clock here. John Jarvis, hope to see you here. <laughs>